I was born in the Smoky Mountains of Western North Carolina and have spent most of my life in these beautiful mountains. I am a former ranger with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, where I worked for several years and had many opportunities to explore some of the most remote areas within its vast 500,000 acre landscape. During this time, I began noticing an increase in strange occurrences taking place throughout different parts of the parklands, such as missing persons cases, unexplained disappearances, unidentified flying objects, UFOs, animal mutilations, and other anomalous phenomena that seemed to be happening more frequently than normal. Although my superiors warned me against discussing these incidents publicly due to their sensitive nature, I became increasingly concerned about what was going on in our national parks and forests and wanted others to know about it too so they could take precautions during their outdoor activities if necessary. One case in particular stands out among the rest what we would come to refer to as the Cherokee Creek Incident. In late 2006, four hikers were reported missing after failing to return from a trip along the Appalachian Trail near Cherokee Creek. A search party was dispatched immediately to locate them, but they were unable to find any sign of the group, even though their footprints could be seen leading off into the distance at various points throughout the forested area. As our team continued searching for clues about what happened to these people, several unusual discoveries were made including large swaths of flattened grass covering an area roughly 50 feet wide by 100 feet long and countless broken tree limbs scattered about the ground everywhere. The only explanation for how this could have occurred without human involvement was if some kind of massive force had plowed through there recently. Yet, no one had been able to provide an adequate answer as to what caused it. During our investigation, we also came across something else rather disturbing nearby. A huge pile of animal bones piled up against a fallen log just beyond where those trees lay strewn about on top each other. Upon closer examination, we noticed that many of these bones appeared to belong to small mammals, such as rabbits, squirrels, and chipmunks, as well as larger ones like raccoons and possums. However, what really struck me as odd was how fresh all of this looked, despite having been picked clean already. Most scavengers rarely leave anything behind except maybe tufts of fur here or there. As we examined the bones more closely, it became evident that something had been gnawing on them, as there were teeth marks all over many of these remains. Furthermore, a number of these animal carcasses showed signs of having been bitten into by some large predatory creature due to puncture wounds near their necks and throats. In other words, whatever did this seemed like it went after its prey with tremendous force, which left jaws capable of crushing even the hardest bone material around. Another oddity worth mentioning is how those bite marks appear to have been made by an animal with razor-sharp fangs instead of typical canine teeth or any other normal predator found living within our parklands. After discovering this grisly scene, I began experiencing an unusual sense of foreboding as if being watched from all directions at once. Yet, whenever I turned around expecting someone else might be standing behind me, there was no one there except for my fellow rangers who were just as puzzled by what we'd uncovered so far during our investigation. While searching through some thick underbrush not far away from where those trees lay uprooted together earlier, one member of our team described seeing something black moving slowly across his line of sight while shining his flashlight beam ahead along a trail leading deeper into woods beyond us. This prompted him to call out but received no response back whatsoever, despite knowing full well he wasn't alone anymore, or so he thought. Upon hearing his call, 
the rest of us quickly turned around and shone our flashlights directly onto where he was looking just seconds ago. However, there was nothing left except darkness once more. As we continued on with our search for these missing hikers, another ranger reported seeing a pair of glowing red eyes staring back at him from behind a nearby tree trunk. This time, though, I made sure to keep an eye out in case anything else happened, while keeping my own flashlight shining steadily forward along that same trail ahead. We then heard something large crashing through underbrush not far away, followed by several loud thuds, which sounded like heavy footfalls coming closer towards our direction. I can assure you that whatever is out there in those woods definitely isn't human. A group of experienced hikers were out on the Appalachian Trail when they encountered a strange creature that they could not identify. The hikers said that it was very tall and skinny, with pale white skin and long black hair. It had large black eyes and a mouth full of sharp teeth. One of the hikers said that it seemed to be staring right at him and that he felt a very strong sense of dread when he saw it. The creature then let out a loud, high-pitched shriek, which the hikers said sounded unlike anything they had ever heard before. They described it as a cross between a baby crying and a woman screaming. Since then, I have been trying to find out as much as I can about this creature. I have spoken with several other park rangers who have had similar experiences and have even heard stories from visitors who claim to have seen the same thing. The descriptions of the creature are always very similar, leading me to believe that it is not just a case of mistaken identity. Recently, I've begun receiving an influx of bizarre reports which further deepens the mystery surrounding these areas. It seems that national parks, often deemed as tranquil havens, are becoming hotspots for inexplicable phenomena. Witnesses have been reaching out with accounts of strange humanoid sightings that defy conventional explanation. One such report came from a hiker in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, who encountered what they described as a pale emaciated figure standing silently beside the trail. It had unnaturally elongated limbs and stood motionless, its eyes fixated on the witness. The hiker felt an overwhelming sense of dread before the figure vanished into the thick foliage without a sound. In another incident, campers at Yosemite National Park reported sighting a large shadowy figure with glowing red eyes watching them from a distance at their campsite during the night. They described the figure as towering and covered in what looked like dark, matted fur. Despite shining flashlights in its direction and shouting, the figure remained still before slowly receding into the darkness. Additionally, rangers in various national parks have come forward with accounts of encountering mimics in the wilderness, entities capable of emitting distress calls identical to those of lost hikers or small children. These sounds often lead search parties on futile chases deepening their confusion and fear. Rangers noted that these calls do not match any known wildlife audio recordings and have been suspected of leading some individuals away from safety, contributing to the unsolved disappearances within these parks. In addition to all of this, I have been a dedicated Sasquatch researcher since 1993. I was an investigator with the BFRO for several years, and during that time, I had three encounters one Class A. In the summer of 2011, the North Carolina Bigfoot Research Organization, NCBFRO, contacted me about reports they were getting of some possible activity near my home. For several weeks, we visited farms and other local areas, interviewing witnesses from several different locations. In late July, I received a call from one witness just north of Balsam Grove, she claimed to have seen a very large reddish-brown creature looking into her living room window while she was watching TV around midnight. Her husband also saw it as he was entering their driveway 
after work at his factory job in Rosman. The woman said that her dogs went crazy, barking and growling, so she rose up to look out the window behind her couch, but could not see anything outside due to glare from the television set. She settled back down onto her sofa, then heard heavy footsteps walking on their wooden porch towards their front door. This is when both she and her husband caught a glimpse of this massive hairy being peering through their storm door, glancing back and forth between them, seemingly confused by its own reflection in the glass. They described it as looking like Chewbacca, only angrier. The man ran for his shotgun as his wife screamed repeatedly at this thing, trying to scare it away unsuccessfully. It turned abruptly, running off their porch, then disappeared into the darkness beyond their yard light's glow before either of them could take aim at it. Over two nights following our investigation, myself, along with four additional researchers, witnessed unusual lights within close proximity of each sighting area including what appeared to be an unknown craft hovering over dense forest during our second night there. It has been nearly 11 years since those events took place, but now I'm beginning to hear stories from locals claiming that others are starting to see similar strange things nearby. Woodland encounters, creepy bird calls that make your skin crawl. I know I don't have time to tell you everything, but I thought it would be important to at least share a fraction of the high strangeness I've witnessed and endured over the years. If you or anyone you know plans on going into the wilderness for any extended period of time, especially overnight, it's so vitally important to be as safe as possible. Always bring a weapon. Had a couple of weird things happen in the woods, but one stands out. Like four years ago, me and my mate were hiking like six miles deep, and we bumped into this old stone building. It looked ancient. We were messing around there for a good hour when the dog started growling. So both of us spotted this creepy, dirt-covered old guy hiding behind some bushes, watching us. Guy looked like he stepped out of a time machine, head to toe in animal hide clothes. Made us wonder how he's surviving out there in the woods, cause he didn't seem starved or anything. We tried talking to him, but unless gibberish is a language, we got nothing meaningful. Still, he seemed kinda friendly in a weird way, as much as a random creepy old dude can be. So, we decided to shake our weird follower, but the dude stalked us for a while before he dipped back into the trees. I've seen some wild stuff on my treks. Some had logic behind him. Some just didn't compute. This will do your head in. One time, I was out hiking early in the AM. Didn't expect any company. Out of nowhere, there's this guy about 30 feet ahead. Dude looked way off, with all black eyes. Like there weren't even sockets. His skin had this weird green tinge to it. We had this long staring contest before he just walks off into the woods and poof, he's gone. Never saw that dude or whatever again. Such a bizarre thing to happen on a solo hike. Just never experienced anything similar before. Been hitting the trails solo since I was a kid. Grew up in the boonies, so it's just normal for me. But yeah, never seen something like that in my life. Could he have been a shapeshifter? Honestly, the thought didn't cross my mind immediately. But thinking back on it, a few things were odd enough to make me ponder the idea. Firstly, his appearance was just too out of place and time. It's not every day you see someone fully decked out in animal hides, especially not in an area that's frequented by hikers. His clothes looked handmade, really old school, like something out of a history book. That in itself was bizarre. Then there's the way he moved and watched us. It was almost predatory, like he was sizing us up, but also curious. Skinwalkers, from what I've read and heard, possess this unnerving quality about them. They observe and mimic human behavior, but there's always something off. This guy, he didn't blink, not once while we were there. 
It was like he was trying to communicate something without talking. The gibberish he spoke, if it can be called speaking, sounded like no language I've ever heard. It was guttural, odd, and unsettling. The lore around shapeshifters mentions how they can't fully mimic human speech. What if this was a failed attempt? And also, his sudden disappearance. We took our eyes off him for maybe a second, and he was gone without a trace. No rustling bushes, no footprints, nothing. It was as if he vanished into thin air. That's not something a regular person, even one used to living in the woods, could pull off so seamlessly. Coupling all these things together, I'm left wondering if we didn't encounter something supernatural. Maybe it sounds far-fetched, but after that encounter, I'm more open to the idea that there are entities out there, like shapeshifters or skinwalkers, that exist beyond our understanding. Not really a believer, but after what I went through, I gotta admit, there's stuff we just can't wrap our heads around. Before we got to the woods that day, there wasn't much out of the ordinary. My mate and I had been planning this hike for a couple of weeks, aiming to explore deeper trails. We prepped our gear the night before, making sure we had enough supplies, first aid kit. We're both kind of outdoor buffs, so hitting new trails was something we always looked forward to. The morning of the hike, we set out early, around sunrise, wanted to make the most of the daylight since we knew we were going deep into the woods. The drive over was the usual banter and excitement about what we might find. We parked the car at our usual spot, a small clearing near the trailhead. The weather was perfect for a hike, not too hot, not too cold, just the right amount of sun peeping through the trees. We did have a small map of the area, but we were more into exploring without sticking strictly to it. The plan was to veer off the beaten path whenever something caught our eye, which is exactly how we ended up bumping into that old stone building. Regarding the man with the black eyes, it's tough to pin down with certainty what we saw. His appearance alone was enough to set our senses on edge. It's not normal, not in any medical or practical sense we know of, to encounter a person with completely black eyes no whites visible at all, and that unnatural greenish skin tone. Esoteric texts and lore often speak of beings with similar descriptions, entities not of this world or dimension. Could he have been an alien, a ghost, or something else? The possibility isn't entirely off the table. His behavior was another thing that threw us off. There was no sense of fear or malice, just this intense curiosity. The way he stared, unblinking, felt like he was peering into our very souls. In the paranormal circles, beings with black eyes are often linked to otherworldly origins, sometimes even demonic. Yet, he exhibited none of the aggression or hostility associated with such entities. Then there's the aspect of him simply vanishing into the woods. We're talking about dense, uneven terrain. Even an experienced woodsman would make some noise moving through, but not him. It was as if he was never there. Disappearing acts are a staple in reports of paranormal sightings, adding another layer of mystery to this encounter. While my mind grapples with rational explanations, could it have been a trick of the light, a hiker in unusual attire? or even a figment of our imagination induced by the isolation of the woods. The more logical part of me struggles to accept any of these. The visceral feeling of encountering something utterly foreign was too potent, too real. To say for certain that we stumbled upon a paranormal entity would be stepping out on a limb. Yet, the alternative, that everything aligned in such a peculiar and unlikely manner just to throw us into confusion seems equally hard to swallow. This experience has left me with more questions than answers, teetering on the brink of dismissing the bounds of my understanding. It has certainly made me more open to entertaining thoughts of the paranormal, even if a part of me remains skeptical. 
clinging to the hope of a logical explanation that has yet to surface. We live in the hollers of central Appalachia. My family has a history with wolves and mountain lions that lived around here when my granddad was young, about 90 years ago. They wiped out lots of farm animals and even took down grown male coon dogs. There are lots of stories about them from that time on. I started deer hunting by myself at age 15. No one else in our family hunted, but I went because I loved being out there, watching nature. One evening during buck season, around 1975 or so, I took a doe just before dark in some woods near where we lived. After taking it, I had to go home to get help dragging it up the hollow to the road for pickup by vehicle since she field dressed over 100 pounds and was too big for me to handle alone, even if my dad wasn't really close by. He dropped me off at one spot and drove on farther. After he left, it was quiet as could be, with only the sound of trickling water coming downstream. The mountains were heavily forested, so when walking quietly on dry leaves, it sounded like nothing more than someone rustling cellophane paper underfoot. My heart stopped when I heard something similar approaching from behind, making its way along the same path, following my scent trail. It came into view, stepping gingerly mid-step, carefully placing each foot lightly without breaking twigs or crunching dead leaves, all while staying partially hidden behind trees peeking head first, then pulling back into cover again quickly. This thing sure didn't want to be seen until it decided what its next move would be, and it waited patiently, watching everything within range and carefully avoiding detection. When it reached an area a little more open, I could see what appeared to be an extremely large animal walking on two legs like a person. Its coat was dark, blackish-brown, shaggy, and looked sort of ratty along its back, as if it had been in a few fights recently. It continued toward me, sniffing the air while watching for movement or listening for sounds that didn't belong there. At 50 yards, I raised my old Remington, which had never jammed yet, but just as soon as I had a sight picture on it, this thing stopped walking and was still as it could be in an instant. It looked right at me, even though I was downwind from it, I should not have been able to smell or see anything, but he sure did. It began with a low growl that turned into almost a deep rumbling sound. A second one came up behind the first one to its right, taking another path through there, then stopped and watched quietly from about 100 yards out, waiting for something to happen. It reacted similarly to the first one upon seeing me. I waited for what seemed like an eternity with them watching while I was doing the same thing, but I was not sure what these things would do next if they continued coming closer. Then I heard my dad give his signal, three soft hoots of an owl, woo woo, a sound that we used when needed. He'd made his way through a short time after I'd shot the doe, but because these things were so close to me at that point, he decided not to walk up on them. He knew I was there, and there was no one else around. He wanted me to know where he was and to stay still until they left, as we'd done lots of other times before, during squirrel season, with all the thick underbrush making it difficult to walk. Later, once back home, he told me that they started running straight away from him while howling loud enough for us both to hear halfway across the hollow. Then. A third one showed up, taking another path from right to left, about 125 yards out, looking down into the small valley that I was in. It watched everything quietly, then started sniffing the air and bobbing its head. It stood there, looking towards me, but didn't move any closer or make noise until the first two ran by it, making a lot of racket as they went, running fast trying to get away from the area, not caring if anyone heard them. This third one then ran fast by itself while howling the same way as the other two did when they left. That's what got me thinking. 
these three may have been werewolves based on their behavior and how they could move so silently around without making any noise in those dry leaves or breaking small twigs underfoot. My dad and I were close, but didn't talk about those things until a few years before he passed away. One day, when my son was visiting us, he asked Grandad if any of the werewolf or Bigfoot stories he'd heard people tell him had ever been true. That's when we found out that his father, my grandfather's first wife, told them about how they were both waiting for each other on the path to walk home together from church back around 1925, where she disappeared after something chased her up a steep hill at night. No one saw anything. But Dad told me how he knew she had been killed by a Bigfoot because one showed up at his grandparents' farm. Her parents, where they raised him afterwards, it stayed hidden in the barn loft during the daytime and only came down at night, looking through the window while grunting loudly as they huddled together in fear, praying until daylight. Granddad later married my grandmother, who said the same thing happened to her once too, before I was born, while walking alone on the road past a large field next to the woods. I believed what he told me and never doubted anything Dad said but I just could not see how it was possible for such things to happen. I asked him why no one had ever gone looking for her or taken action when something like that happened to a family member. It didn't make sense. That's when he told us about all the reasons. From then on, people didn't tell anyone. Going to law enforcement or a judge wouldn't be helpful since they might think you're crazy and lock you up in jail without proof. Normally, I would never entertain such a ridiculous idea as werewolves, but I have no other animal to attach them to. What these things physically resembled kind of reminded me of the werewolves from the movie Dog Soldiers. Similar, but they were still very different. However, if you happen to see one in the distance, you will think to yourself that that was a werewolf especially with how human-like they behaved and how they seemed to show extreme intelligence. I'm not saying that people can change under a full moon, but I am saying there might be creatures out there that are potentially hybrids of some sort. I don't know anymore. It seems like the longer I live in this crazy life, the more it feels like we're living in an actual episode of a sci-fi show or something. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not the best writer in the world. So, I apologize in advance if my experience sounds very disorganized and all over the place. I've tried my best to make it make sense. If there's any part of it that doesn't quite make sense, I'm more than happy to comment on the video to elaborate on certain things. Oh, and by the way, I'd really prefer you not to use my name because I really don't want this shared publicly, at least with my name attached to it. You understand. I was 18 at the time, and it was my first time in the Smoky Mountains. I had never seen mountains before, and I had always wanted to go on a backcountry camping trip, so my dad took me for an overnight hike up Mount Leconte. We went up Alum Cave Trail and stayed at the shelter on top of the mountain. After we dropped our stuff off, we hung out on top of one of those cliffs, enjoying the view for a few hours. On our way down, we woke up at about 3 a.m. As soon as we got to that cliff where you can see all of Gatlinburg from above, something strange started happening. It's hard to explain because there were no words exchanged or anything like that, but it just felt like something didn't want us there anymore and it was trying to scare us away. The only way I can describe how this felt is by saying that both my dad and I had this feeling in our guts that we were not alone anymore, which made no sense given how desolate those woods are during weekdays in late November. So we kept going down Myrtle Point Trail when suddenly this enormous rock comes flying through the air toward us. It landed right next to me. Immediately after, another even bigger rock came flying through the air too but luckily missed both of us. Instead of continuing down Myrtle Point Trail further into the Kefart Prong watershed, where most people hike nowadays, 
There's a less traveled old horse path called Rainbow Falls Horse Path, located behind Sugarland's visitor center, where lots more people hiked back then than they do today, most likely due to increased bear activity caused by decreased human traffic since logging has been banned from national parks nationwide over the past century or two. This really freaked me out because those rocks would have seriously hurt someone if they hit them. After getting myself together mentally, after almost being crushed by boulders thrown hundreds of feet overhead, without warning right beside the trail, while hiking alone with only a flashlight bright enough to illuminate the area ahead clearly, and keeping my eyes peeled carefully, looking around everywhere else nearby, just waiting for any second to hear a huge footstep, followed by a deafening roar to pounce upon unsuspecting prey hidden in the tree branches above, ready to ambush unsuspecting humans below. Scared crapless, hoping against hope to safely make it back to the bottom alive, with my heart beating and pounding in my chest faster than ever before, hoping nothing else crazy happens again tonight because I had already gotten spooked enough. Okay, maybe that's a little overdramatic here. But still, they're not exactly the best memories ever, especially considering everything else that happened later that night. I went back to the Smoky Mountains for two nights, in hopes of seeing a Bigfoot. I had my camera on me at all times. I really wanted to capture some sort of evidence on video or photo, but... It was not meant to be this time. It was around midnight when I started hearing strange noises coming from the woods behind me. They sounded like knocks and grunts, mixed with what seemed like angry monkey calls. The sounds were so loud that they even woke up my wife. The following night, it was around 1.30 a.m., we heard screams and moans coming from one end of the valley, the direction where we were camped. It went on for about 20 minutes and then stopped as suddenly as it began. The next morning, after breakfast, we walked around looking for any possible evidence or signs that there could be Bigfoot activity in the area. We found some broken branches and trees, but nothing else really significant. Even though my wife and I had heard strange things that time, I don't think anything will ever compare to that first time up on Myrtle Trail with my father. I'm seriously convinced there was a bunch of angry Bigfoots up there that did not want us there, hence the boulder throwing. I'm very curious to know what your opinion is on all this. I'm not really educated on Bigfoot in general. I only know a little bit. Is this behavior that they exhibit? Or was it simply maybe a wild man trying to chase us out of the national park? I've had encounters with a skinwalker, and it is not pleasant. The first time I saw one of them, I was nine years old. My family and I lived on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona at the time. We were driving back home from my grandparents' house when we saw what looked like a coyote on the side of the road. But this wasn't just any coyote. It was way bigger than any other coyote I'd ever seen before, and it was covered in black fur, but its eyes were bright yellow. The creature looked right at us as we drove past it. Then it let out this horrible howl that still haunts me to this day. When we got home, my dad told us to go inside and stay there while he went outside to investigate what that thing was himself. He came back into the house an hour later with a weird look on his face but didn't say anything else about what happened. The second time I saw one of these things, I was 16 years old. My friends and I went camping near Canyon de Chelly National Monument, which is also located within Navajo Nation. As we sat around our campfire, telling scary stories, something started throwing rocks at us from out in the darkness. But there shouldn't have been anyone or anything around for miles since we were so far from civilization. All of a sudden, these creatures came running up over the hill towards where our campsite was set up. 
They were moving fast on all fours like some kind of huge dog, and they were growling as if they meant to kill us. We panicked and did something really stupid. We ran toward them, firing our shotguns in their direction without even knowing what those things might be. They turned away from coming after us, then started running back over the hill again. Only now, they weren't using their front legs anymore, but instead used arms and hands just like people do. They disappeared once more over the top of that hill, leaving behind nothing except for the sound of wind blowing through the trees. We packed up all our stuff quickly after that incident happened, then left the area right away, never looking back until there were miles between us and where the last encounter took place. After those incidents, life changed for me forever because now I know exactly why many people say skinwalkers are real. I know for a fact that what I saw was real. I have no reason to lie about this stuff. And even if you don't believe me, it won't change the fact that skinwalkers are out there. They're dangerous creatures who should be avoided at all costs. This was not the first nor the last time I encountered a skinwalker. It seems as if they are stalking my family, and for what purpose, I have no idea. The only thing that seems to be true is that there is something out there that does not want us here. I would like to tell you about an incident that happened when I was 15 years old. My family had just moved from Arizona back home to New Mexico, Gallup. We were living in this tiny house on top of a mountain called Red Mesa. One day, while my mother, father, sister, and myself were all sitting around the dinner table eating, we heard something outside making noises like nothing any of us had ever heard before. We went outside to investigate what it was, but couldn't find anything. Even though whatever it had been was standing less than 50 feet away from where we sat inside our home. That's when my dad noticed some dead birds on the ground near where the creature must have been standing just moments earlier, before disappearing completely without leaving behind any trace whatsoever within a week after this incident. Our dog went missing. We never found out what happened to him, but we all suspected that the creature we had encountered must have taken him away with it. At least, that's what I think. It wasn't until about five years later when my sister and I were talking about those events from back then did she finally tell me something she saw while walking home one day in Red Mesa. She said there was this hill where her bus would drop her off, and then she'd walk down toward our house from there. But on the other side of the hill, closer to our home, there was a strange-looking man standing next to a tree who stared right at her as soon as he noticed her presence. She kept walking, though, because even though she felt uncomfortable, there was some reason she couldn't understand. When she made it home safely, without anything else happening during the rest of the walk back, we never spoke about what had happened again. Until now. I believe that the reason skinwalkers are so difficult to catch is that they do not exist in the physical realm as we know it. They can change shape and appearance at will, making them invisible to our eyes unless they want us to see them. I also think that whatever these creatures really are, they feed off negative energy, which is why people who encounter them often feel drained or sick afterwards. In fact, my sister got really sick with flu-like symptoms a couple different times after she reportedly had a strange running with this man. For whatever reason, she never told us about him until way later. I can't for certain say what he was, but when you align all the pieces together, it does make sense. I apologize if my stories are not in chronological order. I'm just trying to get them out on paper as best I can. I feel like I have to warn people and get this information out there to the best of my ability. I'm out of time at the moment. In the meantime, stay safe and be careful where you go. I was 16 years old and I had just gotten my driver's license. My friend, who we'll call Jay, were going to go camping in the woods behind his house. 
We got there around 6 o'clock p.m. on a Friday night. It was mid-October, so it was getting dark early. We set up our tent and started a fire for some hot dogs. As we sat by the fire, Jay told me that he had heard something moving around in the woods earlier, but didn't think much of it at first because he thought it might have been a deer or something like that. I should mention now that this area is known for having coyotes, bobcats, bears, though they are rare, etc. So we both brought along our hunting rifles with us as well. After about an hour or two of sitting by the fire, talking about random stuff, school, girls, sports, Jay said he could hear whatever it was again. He asked if I would come with him to check out what it was because he didn't want to be alone when doing so. I agreed and grabbed my rifle before heading into the woods with him. As soon as we stepped off his property line into the forested area beyond his backyard, everything went silent. No crickets chirping, nothing. Jay looked at me wide-eyed and whispered, what do you make of this? I shrugged my shoulders, not knowing what to say. Then suddenly, from somewhere ahead of us, came this loud howl, growl, scream type sound. It sounded like nothing either one of us had ever heard before. It made every hair on my body stand straight up. I turned towards Jay, who looked absolutely terrified. He mouthed, let's get out of here. We ran back through those trees faster than any human beings have ever run before. When we finally reached his yard again, after running nearly half a mile without stopping once, I realized that neither one of us even bothered grabbing our guns, which were still leaning against a tree where we left them. We stood there panting, trying to catch our breaths while looking back into those trees, wondering what kind of animal could have made such an awful noise. Then, suddenly, from right behind us came another howl, growl, scream type sound. This time, though, instead of being far away like last time, whatever made this second noise sounded like it couldn't have been more than 10 feet away from where we stood. I don't know why, but instinctively, both Jay and myself knew not to turn around, no matter what happened next. The only thing separating ourselves from whatever creature lurked behind us was maybe 20 feet of grassy lawn. That meant all either one of us needed to do to reach safety would be to take three steps forward onto the mowed grass. But neither one did anything except stand there frozen stiff, staring straight ahead into those trees, waiting for God knows what. On three, I whispered, barely above a whisper. One, two, three, and then together, both Jay and myself bolted across that small patch between ourselves and safety, never once daring to look over our shoulders until safely inside his house. When inside, safe under a roof once more, both parents asked why we were home already. Neither one of us wanted to tell them the truth fearing ridicule or worse, being grounded. So instead, we lied, saying it was too cold outside and decided to come home early. Two days later, on Sunday afternoon, police showed up asking questions regarding a missing person's report filed on Saturday morning. One person reported missing, John Doe, age 32. According to the file given to the police officers, John Doe went hiking alone late Friday afternoon, planning to return Saturday evening. He never returned. They searched the entire weekend and found nothing. The police questioned everyone living within a five-mile radius surrounding the park. Nothing unusual was reported by anyone else besides ourselves. Why did the search party find nothing, despite the fact the man's car was parked less than a mile away from the trailhead, leading deep within the park itself? Why haven't we seen hide nor hair of him since the day he disappeared, despite extensive searches conducted throughout the region, including areas deemed impossible to traverse due to rugged terrain? Was the case eventually closed? 
as an unsolved mystery, officially listed as presumed dead, yes, we weren't sure what to make of it all. Our nerves were frayed, and the thoughts spinning in our heads were a tangled mess of fear and unanswered questions. Look, I can only realistically tell you what I know and what I believe to know. I'm not really schooled in the behavior of animals, nor am I an expert in local folklore or unexplained phenomena. The fact that something out there frightened us to the core is undeniable, but to draw conclusions beyond that, to speculate on the missing man's fate or to link that chilling sound unmistakably to his disappearance, that's where I hesitate to tread. It's one thing to recount the raw fear we felt in those woods. It's quite another to assert a connection to something so serious and final as a man's vanishing. Certainly, after that night, the lines between reality and the lore that feeds the supernatural blurred for me. My logical side wants to attribute the terrifying sounds to a known creature, perhaps a bobcat or a coyote, as our region is known for. Yet, the marrow deep fear suggests something beyond common understanding. I've always approached tales of the supernatural with a skeptical curiosity finding them enthralling, yet not fully allowing myself to believe. But now, having experienced such inexplicable terror firsthand, the possibility that there might be truths hidden in those old legends creeps into my mind. It's not so much that I believe in the supernatural as a certainty. Rather, it's that I can no longer dismiss it outright. Our experience has become a personal anecdote of the unexplained, one that resonates with the traditional narratives of things that lurk just out of sight in the dark corners of our reality. If you have questions, if there's something that doesn't quite fit or seems too shrouded in the fog of our fear to make sense, please ask for any answers I can supply you. I realize our story Unsettling as it is, might leave gaps, spaces where the brush strokes of our recollection fail to paint the full picture. Thank you for reading. I was a 24-year-old seasonal employee at the time, working at Roosevelt Lodge in Yellowstone National Park. I had moved there from New York State to take the job and was an animal enthusiast particularly fond of bears and wolves. I have since learned that all of us, including myself, can be delusional when it comes to things we love and enjoy. This is my story. We had ended our work season on September 11th or 12th, as the snows were coming in heavily in September. The entire lodge staff, along with a few others from other lodges, were treated by our management to a trip down through Hayden Valley where we saw several grizzly bears digging up food for their winter hibernation. After returning back through Dunraven Pass towards Tower Falls Junction Road, it was getting dark quickly, as you do not drive fast on these types of roads because animals are constantly crossing the road. As we got around what seemed like an endless number of switchbacks going downhill towards Tower Junction, I saw something walking alongside the road about 75 feet away or so that appeared to be human-shaped but much too large to actually be human. It was covered head to toe in brownish-red hair which looked very thick, with some lighter colors mixed into it here and there, which would give off a sheen as soon as the headlights hit it, which they did. The animal never once looked back at me or slowed down its pace but continued walking right next to our vehicle, as if looking straight ahead, just like any other person might when out for an evening walk, except this person stood approximately eight feet tall, compared to the six-foot guardrails by the side of the road. The one thing that has always stuck with me about this experience is how hairy its legs were all the way up to the thigh area before becoming obscured by darkness underneath the bottom edge of the window line inside the car door panels. Its arms also hung down past its knees, even though bent slightly forward while walking. 
which gave off the appearance of having longer than normal hands until it finally disappeared behind another hilltop. Going downhill again in a left-hand turn so we could no longer see anything more after this point. Afterward, everyone turned around and looked at each other in silence before someone said, Did anyone else just see that? People confirmed they saw the same thing, followed by lots of speculation and talk among the group over the rest of the journey, asking questions and trying to figure out what exactly happened, together without coming to any conclusion. None of us really knew anything more than anybody else already had beforehand anyway. It appeared quite obvious that it was most likely a Sasquatch, whom they all agreed later to talk amongst themselves about afterward, when nobody present would admit to seeing such things happening around them. Whether natural occurrences or strange, bizarre ones, you never know who might try at any other time later to go back and look again themselves during daytime hours for a better view in the light, to see something else happening that was previously unknown. I remember all this happening very well because I had never seen anything like it before and have not seen anything since then either, which would make me question my sanity. Also, because there was so much discussion about what everybody thought they saw or didn't see afterward, without ever really coming up with any answers we could agree upon, besides the general consensus being, yes, definitely something was walking next to the road that appeared human-shaped, but way too large compared to the typical size and shape humans are supposed to be. Am I coming from an illogical and irrational place? I'm pretty sure that this had to have been what we all assumed was a Sasquatch. After all, this area is teeming with wildlife and plenty of game assuming this creature eats meat. You also have to take into consideration the vast amount of backcountry and dense protected forestry this thing has to hide in. It would make sense, I guess. Back in 98-99, I was serving at RAG, and I had this buddy who was super into camping in the Smoky Mountains. We figured we'd go together next time we both had leave. So come summer 99, we headed to Townsend, Tennessee, and camped out on his uncle's farm. On our second night, we were jolted awake by intense rain at around 2.30 a.m. We were just chilling, listening to the rain hit our tent when we heard this freaky scream outside. Seriously, it was like something out of Jurassic Park. It screamed four times in about 10 minutes, then went silent. My buddy was like, dude, what was that? Told him, it's probably an animal. But we both knew that wasn't true. No animal sounds like that. He asked if I really thought it was an animal. I said no. Next thing you know, another screech right behind our tent. This one sounded fiercer. We were so freaked that at dawn, we packed up and bolted within 15 minutes. Never told anyone about this for years, no one would have believed us. Now get this, I had an even crazier experience when I was a kid that reminded me of our experience camping out here. In fact, the only reason why I think I'm able to understand what happened with me and my friend is because of this experience when I was a kid. You tell me what you think. As kids, my bro and I were messing around in the woods behind our old place in Delta, Pennsylvania. So we're out playing and hear this crazy sound like a rumbling growl. The damn thing shook the ground. We turn and bolt but not before noticing this 15-foot beast standing tall with reddish fur everywhere. It was like a wolf gorilla mutant or something. Get home and mom's all, Hey, Channel 8 was just saying York County is having a Bigfoot frenzy. Wild, right? I'm pretty sure Bigfoot is a Nephilim from the Bible. There's a bunch of them chilling in the world unseen. Anyone know Tom Horn? Dude's written loads on this stuff super clued up. He wrote this book on the path of the immortals, saying that the government and scientists are working to open portals to other dimensions. Apparently, that's where these creatures are hiding till they're ready to show up. 
I can't be completely certain, but I'm pretty sure of what I'm talking about. I am a 37-year-old mother of one who works as an administrative assistant at a local hospital. I grew up in Idaho and have lived here my entire life. I'm married to my husband, who is also from this area. We met when we were both in high school and started dating soon after graduation. My husband has always been interested in the outdoors and nature, so he's taken me on many camping trips over the years. When our son was born, we decided that it would be fun to take him along with us too. So far, he hasn't had any problems being outside all day long, except for maybe getting a little bit sunburned every now and then. I've never really experienced anything strange or unusual before this incident happened while camping at Grand Teton National Park. In 2014, my husband and I took our son on a camping trip to Grand Teton National Park. We had been there before, so we knew where we wanted to camp, but there were no open sites in the area that we liked. My husband suggested that we pull into one of the empty campsites for an hour or so while he gathered some wood from around us. When my husband came back with the wood, he said it was really weird because as soon as he got out of the car, he heard this tapping noise coming from behind him. He turned around but didn't see anything at first. Then, all of a sudden, right behind him, there was a tree branch hanging down about seven feet off the ground. It started shaking as if somebody was pulling on it. Then, just as suddenly, it stopped, and everything went dead silent for about five seconds. That's when I heard what sounded like two rocks being banged together, not far away either. Right after that, I saw what looked like two big black birds flying over us, but they were definitely not crows because their wingspan was too wide, and when they flew, you could barely hear them flapping their wings. That's when things started getting scary. The birds were flying about 20 feet above us, but they never made a sound as they flew by. As we watched them fly away, our son asked what kind of birds those were and my husband said he didn't know because they looked like nothing he had ever seen before. The next day, when we got home from our trip, my husband started researching different types of birds that might look similar to what we saw in Grand Teton National Park. After hours of searching online, he couldn't find anything that matched exactly what we had witnessed on this camping trip. I am a Christian and I believe in God. My husband is also a Christian, but he believes that there's more to this world than what we can see with our eyes. He thinks that maybe these flying creatures are some kind of demons or something like that. I'm usually a pretty grounded woman. My husband, God bless him, likes to jump to fantastic theories pretty quickly. He questioned me about the large flocks of birds and then suggested what we were seeing might be supernatural. My husband kind of got fixated on the Mothman scenario only because it was just really creepy and he wanted to make sure that, you know, was it maybe just a weird big bird that seemed oddly human-like? That, I think, is the thing that kind of set the whole tone for my hesitation. I tend to be kind of a skeptical person. It always pleases me to tell people I keep my feet on the ground, so I'm not the person to just jump to fantastical conclusions or any kind of weird supernatural explanations. It's really hard to shake the feeling that we stumbled onto something far more, I don't even know the word, far more outside the realm of normal than something so simply explained as an actual bird, even as weird as it looked. The vibe, just the atmosphere, everything about it, I'm not prone to believing in precognition, but I at best try my best to stay rooted and go where my senses and understanding lead me here. We have been going around trying to kind of codify what we've seen via interviews and comments, etc., on his channel, looking for exactly what this might be. I think, for the time being, my husband is really connected to the idea that these birds were actually messengers or harbingers of a bad omen to come. I have experienced things that I cannot explain. 
My husband and I saw something walking through the woods behind our house, but when we turned on the floodlights, it was gone. This happened many times. We hear strange noises at night coming from deep within those same woods. Sometimes, even though there should be nothing out there besides normal forest critters running around here all day long. The last time anything like this happened before now was two years ago, after seeing what looked like a large dog standing near the tree line, watching us play together while the children still lived with me here alone. Their father had left again without saying where he was going first, so I thought maybe he would just stay for a few days until he came back home again. That changed after one evening when I heard loud footsteps outside. I opened the door to see black eyes staring back at me through the darkness, with the porch light being reflected off them instead of revealing their true nature. Whatever it was seemed almost human in appearance except for the shape and size. They were definitely not any person I could ever imagine existing anywhere else. These events made me want to find answers about why things were happening much more frequently now than before, or if it might help others who are experiencing similar strange occurrences lately. I was born in Kentucky and have lived there all my life. I am 62 years old now on a small farm that is about 20 miles from any neighbors or stores. The closest store to me is the Dollar General, which is about 18, 20 miles away. Growing up as a child, we had strange things happen around our house, like hearing footsteps on the roof, something heavy walking through the fields behind us late at night, seeing shadow figures moving outside when it was dark enough to see inside from the porch light, etc. My father always told me those were just coyotes out there, but I knew better even back then because you could tell by the sound how many feet they had instead of four legs, like most animals do. One time, while playing hide-and-seek with friends in the deep woods nearby, I saw what looked like a large dog standing near the tree line watching us play together, but didn't think anything else about it until much later. After graduating from high school, I went off to college far from home, where I met my husband, who worked as an engineer for NASA before retiring recently due to health reasons, among other things. Every summer, we would go out camping at a spot near where my grandparents live, deep in the woods. We'd set up our tents and start telling stories around the fire as soon as it got dark enough to see the stars. One night when I was 16 years old, something happened that changed me forever. After everyone had gone to bed but me, my parents included. I decided to take a walk by myself through the forest behind our campsite, just because I felt like exploring a new area since I had never been there before, even though I probably shouldn't have, considering everything going on then. As soon as I stepped outside the tent, I could tell how different this place looked compared to the usual places we went to every year. Most times it was still pretty light out, despite getting close to midnight already, so I didn't feel too scared walking alone around the trees themselves, which seemed taller than normal, almost as if reaching towards the sky itself that night. Or maybe I just imagined all that part. I don't know. But that same noise came back again, even louder than before, except this time it seemed closer like maybe right behind us, somewhere nearby, or just inside our tent itself. We didn't sleep much after that because we kept hearing footsteps coming from all directions surrounding the campsite until early morning when we were finally able to leave without feeling too scared anymore. I believe what I experienced as a teenager then is the same creature that's been following me my whole entire life and has now been on our property. I don't know if this thing has planned on following me or what it is. It's been keeping tabs on me, and I know it. I have so many more stories of growing up and having similar experiences, not just with this canine thing, but with supernatural entities. Those are stories for other times, though, because I simply don't have the ability to write it all down at the moment. Let me know what you think, and I can always go into more detail for you. Thanks. I love your show.
I'm not sure if this is what you're looking for, but here goes nothing. I was raised in a very religious household and have always believed that there are forces out there which we cannot see or understand. My parents were both devout Christians who taught me from an early age about the existence of God and how He created everything around us, including ourselves. They also told me stories about angels, demons, ghosts, etc., as well as other supernatural phenomena such as UFOs and aliens, all things considered to be part of the spiritual realm by many people today, myself included. So basically, my beliefs boil down to this. There's more going on than meets the eye. This world isn't just made up of physical matter like rocks and trees. It's also filled with invisible energy fields, called spirits, which can affect our lives in various ways depending on their nature or characteristics, good versus evil, plus whether they choose to interact with us directly or indirectly via some sort of medium, channel, etc. That being said though, I don't think that every single thing reported experienced by someone has any sort of paranormal supernatural explanation behind it whatsoever. In fact, most times when something happens to me personally, or when I hear read about others having similar experiences, I'll usually try to find some rational logical reason why before jumping right into assuming it must have been caused by a ghost, demon, alien. Anyway. I'm 24 years old, and I live in California. I've been interested in cryptozoology for as long as I can remember. So when my family decided to go on a trip to Yosemite National Park, it was like a dream come true. We got there early one morning and went out hiking right away, since we wanted to make the most of our time there. It's such a beautiful place with all the trees and mountains that you almost forget about everything else around you until something like what happened, happens. After this incident occurred, which is still hard for me to believe even now, we left immediately without stopping anywhere else, because none of us knew what had just happened or why, but whatever it was definitely didn't seem friendly at all. I was in Yosemite National Park with my family. We were staying at a hotel there and had gotten up early to go out hiking. I went ahead of the rest of my family because I wanted to get some good pictures. So, I'm walking along this trail when suddenly, everything around me goes silent. The birds stop singing, the wind stops blowing, everything just stops. Then I hear something behind me. I turn around and see a black figure standing about 20 feet away from me on the trail. The thing is huge. It's got these long arms that almost touch the ground and it's covered in fur. Its face looks like a cross between a human and an ape. It starts making this low growling sound as it moves towards me. I'm terrified, so I start running back down the trail towards where my family is waiting for me. But before I can get very far, this thing jumps onto my back and knocks me to the ground. It starts trying to bite me while pulling at my clothes with its hands. I manage to kick it off of me and then run faster than ever before until finally catching up with my family, who are all wondering what happened since they didn't hear anything unusual. We end up leaving right away without stopping anywhere else in the park, which means we never found out what that thing was or why it attacked me. I think that there are probably a lot of things out there in the wilderness that we don't know about. I mean, Look at all the animals and plants that have been discovered over just the past few years alone. It's amazing to me how much is still unknown even though we've been exploring this planet for thousands of years now. So, yeah. I definitely believe that there are more creatures like what I saw out there somewhere. I don't like to talk about it because I still have nightmares sometimes. I'm afraid that if I tell people what happened, they won't believe me. Or worse yet think I'm crazy. And then there's also the fact that my family doesn't want anyone else knowing about this either, since we all agreed not to say anything when we left Yosemite National Park. But mostly though, it's just really hard for me emotionally whenever someone brings up the incident, 
because even now, after everything that has happened since then, which is a whole other story in itself, part of me still feels like maybe somehow, some way, something bad will happen again, someday soon, unless I keep quiet and pretend like nothing ever did. Sorry about the long post, but I wanted to make sure you had all the details. If you have any questions or need more information, just let me know. In 2013, I was working a job that brought me to the beautiful west coast of Oregon and Washington. It was this time that I was on a job site in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. We were working for the USFS, doing some road maintenance, and I had been with this company for about three years at that point. It was early morning, probably around 6.30 or so, when my boss told me to take a truck out of commission because he needed to do some work on it. So, I drove down the mountain about five miles until I found a place where there was enough room to park off the side of the road without blocking traffic. As soon as I got out of the truck, something felt wrong. The first thing that caught my attention was how quiet everything seemed. Usually, you can hear birds chirping or bugs buzzing, but now there wasn't even wind blowing through trees like normal either which made me feel uneasy, since it's always windy up here in Washington State. As I looked around trying to figure out what exactly was making me feel this way, I noticed two things almost simultaneously. One being an extremely strong odor coming from somewhere nearby, which smelled similar to rotting meat mixed with sulfur. And then secondly, realizing that there weren't any sounds whatsoever anymore except for my own breathing and footsteps. No animals calling out or anything else, really other than complete silence. I was terrified and immediately got back into the truck, locked all of the doors, and rolled up my windows. I sat there for a few minutes trying to calm down, but then suddenly felt something brush against the side of our vehicle, which made me jump in fright again. It took a while before I finally got out from behind the wheel once more so that I could see what had happened. But when I looked around, everything seemed normal. No sign whatsoever that anything had been near us at any point during this entire ordeal. I drove away as fast as possible while still keeping an eye on the rearview mirror just in case something else might happen. Which thankfully, it didn't. This was my first time ever experiencing anything like this, so I didn't know what to do or how long it would last. The smell eventually faded away after about 15 minutes, but then suddenly there came a loud noise from behind me that sounded almost like someone screaming at the top volume, only much deeper and more guttural sounding than any human could possibly make. It reminded me of some kind of animal call. I turned around quickly, expecting to see something horrible standing right in front of me, but instead, all I saw were trees swaying back and forth wildly as if they had been hit by an earthquake. I'd like to start off by saying that I'm generally a pretty rational human being but I was camping with my girlfriend and her family at a campground in the Manistee National Forest. We had been there for about three days when I woke up one morning to go fishing by myself. It was around 5.30 a.m., just before sunrise. I walked down to the river and crossed it on a log jam that had formed from fallen trees into the water. I started walking through some of the thickest woods I've ever seen, it's like this all over Michigan, so thick you can't see more than 10 feet in front of you. After about an hour or two of walking, I found a clearing with a small pond slash lake and decided to fish there. As soon as I got close enough to cast my line out onto the lake, something screamed at me from across the water. The only way I can describe it is like a woman screaming bloody murder, but deeper and louder. It scared me so bad that I dropped everything and ran back towards camp as fast as I could. 
When I got back to camp, everyone was still asleep, except for my girlfriend's dad, who was sitting by the fire drinking coffee. We talked for a while. Then he said he wanted to show me something. He took me into his RV, where he showed me pictures of footprints that he'd taken earlier that week near our campsite. They were huge, at least twice as big as any human footprint I've ever seen. The vastness and remoteness of places like the Manistee National Forest provide perfect hiding spots for creatures unknown to modern science. It's not just the dense forests in Michigan, but all over the country. There are reports of strange and unexplainable sightings that often go unnoticed or are brushed off. Considering how little we've explored or understood about these deep, dense areas, it's entirely plausible that there are beings living there, away from human eyes. The scream I heard was unlike anything I've ever known to exist. It makes me wonder what else is out there, lurking in the shadows of our national parks, just beyond our sight and understanding. Growing up, I was always the curious type, fascinated by the stories my grandpa would tell me about his adventures in the woods. He was an avid outdoorsman, spending most of his life hunting, fishing, and exploring every nook and cranny of the Michigan wilderness. He used to say, there's more in these woods than deer and fish, keep your eyes open, and you might just see something you can't explain. I guess you could say that's where my interest in the unexplained began. I've spent a considerable amount of time in the outdoors myself, following in my grandpa's footsteps. I've seen my fair share of wildlife and experienced the unexplainable feeling of being watched when no one else is around. But I've always approached these experiences with a skeptic's mind. It's made me think back to my grandpa's stories with a new perspective, wondering if there was more truth to them than I initially believed. Perhaps my background and openness to the unknown made me a prime candidate for such an encounter. It's as if all those years of being in the woods, listening and learning, had prepared me for that moment by the lake. It was in 2005, and my wife and I were driving to our family reunion. We left on a Saturday morning, July 9th, around 6 a.m. from Bismarck, North Dakota. My dad had given us an old cell phone of his for emergencies since we didn't have one at the time. We traveled down Highway 83, heading south towards Pierre, South Dakota. About halfway between Glenham and Selby, South Dakota, we got into a very bad thunderstorm with heavy rain. I was traveling about 55 miles per hour when I hit a puddle of water going across the road. This caused me to hydroplane off the highway. Our car rolled two times before coming to rest on its top right side in some tall grasses near the edge of a small slough. The impact shattered both front windows, sending glass everywhere inside as well as outside all over the area around where it came to rest. The cell phone was flung out through one of those broken windows during the rolls. I couldn't find it anywhere after looking for it so many times. We were waiting there, hoping someone would stop by or see us lying there in this mess. We didn't know if anyone would stop because nobody else was out traveling in such terrible weather conditions at that time. This part happened probably five minutes after stopping, but just before trying to look for that missing phone again. When my wife opened her eyes, she looked over at me. I was still hanging upside down, buckled up but unconscious. Then, she saw this shadow figure standing beside her door, reaching down inside with its arm stretched out towards her face. She quickly shut her eyes, thinking he might be helping, but nothing happened. So, she reopened them, only to see nothing now except total darkness surrounding her. She said something startled her awake and scared her too. Even though she could hardly move due to being strapped into the seatbelt tightly against her chest cavity, she was also trying to escape this vehicle trapped underwater. She said this dark figure appeared solid black, wearing some type of long coat or cloak, 
but she couldn't make out any features on its face since it was so close to her. This incident occurred in the middle of a cornfield near Glenham, South Dakota. I usually like to turn off the radio and concentrate on driving while on a road trip, but not this time for some reason. I normally don't like to listen to the radio while driving, which is something new since the accident. I've been through many storms on road trips before and since that time, usually holding the vehicle straight and steady during the much bigger storms we've encountered on some road trips since that time. Still, I can't shake the feeling that we wouldn't have wrecked if we hadn't been listening to that song playing. If you guys have made it this far into the episode, go ahead and comment down below National Forest Mysteries so I know who made it to the end of the episode. If you guys enjoyed today's massive episode of new stories, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more accounts of the strange, unexplained, and the paranormal. I'll see you guys later.